My name is Sunday Idoko Onu. Most of you know me as Sunny. I was born in Lokoja, Kogi State, Nigeria. My parents were both in the Nigeria Police Force, so we had to move on several occasions, but eventually settled in the city of Lagos, which is located in the southwest of the country, uh, where my dad um, later went on to become chief of police. I attended police primary school, reserved for children of high-ranking police officers. Life was good, and each day after school, I enjoyed roaming the streets with my friends. I was raised in a Christian home, and I have fond memories of waking up to the sound of praise and worship as my mother led the family in morning devotion. Age 12, I had the opportunity of a lifetime to live and study in the UK. I lived with my uncle's family in Liverpool and was fortunate enough to attend a local comprehensive. Moving to England was a complete culture shock and the beautiful Liverpoolian accent certainly made life interesting to say the least. Some of my early interactions with the locals would make a good comedy sketch. Now, for a privileged African boy, adjusting to life in Liverpool wasn't easy. We lived in Toxteth, which was a diverse but poor working class neighborhood. The first street we lived in was half boarded up. The remnants of race rides from years gone by still fresh on display. It was clear little investment had made its way up north and I was quick to learn that the city had a rough reputation, many of which I would later uh, come to dismiss as fear mongering, but some held up. I had seen deprivation in Africa, but not like this. Gang affiliations and drug-infused quarrels were the order of the day. I had to navigate my way to school by sidestepping heroin addicts and prostitutes. For the first time, I had to, I had began to question the glossy image of Britain that we were spoon-fed in Africa. I had never seen this sequence in any James Bond films I watched growing up. Poverty in England was not something I had comprehended before, but now it had become a daily reality I had to wrestle with. For me, my greatest struggle was not the deprivation or adjusting to the Liverpool accent, nor was it the wet and free freezing temperatures that suddenly greets you each time you step out of your door. My greatest struggle was an internal one. For the first time, it occurred to me that I was black. At least that was how I would be categorized by the society I found myself. Being black in this society carried an eerie connotation a social construct I had not fully understood. I knew what it was to be African or Nigerian, but the term black had no meaning to me. I had lived all my life never contemplating race or skin color. After my initial culture shock, my education on racism would be swift and immediate. It was like jumping from the frying pan and into the fire. I remember an episode in which my white friend um, squeamishly had to explain the N-word because earlier that day, a white gentleman had made, it, made the utterance in my direction, but I didn't know what it meant. I had never heard it before. Despite all the telltale signs, I was gleefully ignorant of the danger I was in. But the death of Stephen Lawrence and the national media coverage would change that. It suddenly occurred to me my blackness made me a target for, for some. I soon learned to avoid certain areas of the city. My school had only 10 black children out of 600. The other nine were born and raised in the UK. Most of them had little or no contact with the African side. They were black British, a term that would later become a stumbling block between us. To them, I wasn't even real black. I was African. As far as they were concerned, to be black African was a little lower than being black British. And so I would get racial tons from, and, and ridicule from both black and white kids. Initially, I was bemused by the whole experience because it started with them asking rather silly questions such as, did you live in a house in Africa or did you, did you keep lions and baboons as pets? I had lived in Africa all my life and had never seen a lion. 
I was raised in an affluent part of Nigeria and my family compound was larger than the entire street I lived in in Liverpool. Yet, somehow, these kids thought I was less civilized and hardly believed anything I told them about my life back home. I would go on to experience racism in its cruelest form. But I won't dwell on it, in part to avoid painting Liverpool as the racist capital um, of England. It wasn't. My experience wasn't so different from many other young Africans living elsewhere in the country at the time. It was just the times we lived in. This was the early 90s. Fast forward 25 years and Liverpool is a thriving multicultural city I love. I have wonderful friends and family living there today. In light of the Black Lives Matter protest and the murder of George Floyd, it would be a shame not to express how I feel about it. It is certainly sad to watch the carnage on our streets in recent weeks. And as a black man living in Britain, it is important for me to say that historically, the UK has managed racial tensions far better than the US. And there is evidence to support the view that our society is less racially divided and punitive than the US. The protesters would do well to acknowledge this fact if they wish to build on the progress that has already been made by their forebears. However, I understand the rage on the streets and my view on the current protest may sound slightly philosophical because I think as humans, we often take a myopic view on major events happening around us. These issues are far more complex. It is important to note in the UK, most of our equality laws were first introduced in the 60s and 70s, but these were only achieved after years of race riots on our streets. There is no equality law anywhere in the world that has ever been enacted because the government thought of it first. Governments always had to be pushed, sometimes by force, to protect the rights of minority groups. As a black man living in Britain, I know I am the beneficiary of those early protesters and rioters from all ethnic backgrounds who did not make excuses for the bad, inadequate policies perpetuated by the government of the day but put themselves on the line to change the law, all to protect strangers they didn't know, but mainly for people that look like me. And just like now, we're also people back then who were more interested in keeping the peace and protecting historical monuments than to speak up against racial injustice. This is not to say these individuals were necessarily racist. It had more to do with the fact that racism predominantly affects communities of color, and unless one lives or has a strong affiliation with these communities, then they may not understand or have any interest in their daily struggles. It doesn't make them a racist. They are simply uninformed. We all live our lives in a bubble of close friends and families, and it, and it is their struggles that we mainly care about. I know from experience, the phrase Black Lives Matter irritates some people, um, but the fact that in the year 2020, there are still people whose daily existence are dominated by how others view them is a sign that though uh, we have wonderful laws on paper and diversity has become a buzzword in most companies, the reality on ground is somewhat different. The protesters are not asking that people of color be treated better than their Caucasian brothers and sisters. They are not even asking that they be treated the same. They are asking that they are treated as individuals. This is the singular difference between the black and the white and black experience in the world today. To be judged as an individual is something most white people take for granted because it has never been taken from them. As a black man, it is often the case that I'm careful how I present myself in white spaces. Not because I want to be seen as a nice guy, but simply because I do not want any indiscretion on my part to impact how other black people are viewed. It is a burden that many of us carry because we found ourselves in situations where the actions of another black person were projected on us, leading to a difficult, awkward and sometimes dangerous confrontation, especially when dealing with the police. These situations had nothing to do with my personal behavior or actions, but simply because someone else, usually white, assumed the worst in me because they were afraid or uncomfortable. This may simply sound to you like random acts of misunderstanding, 
but the frequency and consistency of the shared experience among people of colour suggests otherwise. The other point I must touch on relates to the destruction of monuments and statues of historical figures. I have read many comments on social media lamenting the desecration of such monuments and it is a real shame that some protesters have resorted to using these tactics. There is no need to damage properties to make a point. However, I am of the opinion that as a nation, we are shaped by the stories we tell ourselves and the heroes we worship. There is no greater story than the Second World War and the heroes such as the great Sir Winston Churchill, the leader responsible for guiding Britain through the dark times. It's, this is a story I was taught in school and this remains the prevailing narrative about his tenure in office. But here lies the great paradox of any human story. We are not one-dimensional characters, and often the checkered past of history only survive in the consciousness of those our heroes bamboozled on their path to stardom. You see, for an African like myself, I was also taught the version of history that our national curriculum conveniently forgot to include. And as many young, educated English people explore the world visiting former British colonies, they begin to unearth the other side of the story, which leaves them perplexed, cheated and angry that so much was done in their name, but gently erased out of the history books. It is that resentment that is pouring out on our street today. The young men are saying, not in my name. Slave traders are not people we ought to be celebrating. These men were controversial even in their day. For the record, I am not claiming Sir Winston was a slave trader. I happen to like him. He was a great orator. Nonetheless, some students of history, especially those familiar with the Bengal region of India, may have a slightly different take on his celestial mythology. I'd like to think many of you know me well enough to understand where this is coming from. I was born in Nigeria but raised in Britain. I am proud of both countries because they have helped shape the man I am today. Yes, it's true that I experienced racism and have enough stories to fill a book, but the UK has also given me more opportunities than I can ever imagine. And for that, I must view my painful experiences through the right lens, knowing fully well that most of my encounters with people are positive. I hope we find the right way to talk about race. But unless we listen to the communities mostly affected by this cancer, this whole thing will remain on the loop and rear its ugly head every few years. As a Christian, I know my identity is in Christ. But since the color of my skin is often the first thing you see and not my faith, it begs to ask the question, what does my skin color mean to you. Hopefully we begin to see how any implicit bias affects the decisions we make or conclusions we derive when interacting with people of color. With God nothing is impossible and I sure believe that through his love his children can live in harmony. Luke 10 verses 25 to 37. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbour as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbour? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was travelling from Jerusalem down to Jericho when he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man laying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there but also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. 
Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man, and if the bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbour to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Well, good morning, church. That was great uh, to hear from Sonny, wasn't it, to hear of his experiences. Thank you, uh, Sonny, for that. Uh, this morning, you will notice that it's a little bit different. Uh, I haven't got uh, my bunch of uh, fruit that I normally have uh, behind me when I'm preaching in the dining room. Uh, I'm with a good friend of mine, uh, Jennifer Isaacor. Uh, Jennifer, it's lovely to see you this Hi, morning. Thank you, Wayne. And uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, so my name's Jennifer, um, and I'm in my 50s, sort of thing. Um, <laughs> oh, never. <laughs> <laughs> and I live in, in, in Chelmsford in Essex. I've known Wayne uh, going back a long time now from when he was in Loughton, um, and count him, Jem, and the kids as really good friends. I've lived in Essex probably for about ooh, 20 odd years now, and I attend a church called Restore Community Church. Um, and uh, again, part of, um, you know, part of one church family in the area in Lambton. Mm. Um, I work, um, I run my own business. I work as a, cons a trainer, facilitator, leadership coach, and I work particularly on something with cultural intelligence, which is what we were doing with the leadership yesterday. Yeah. And um, and I have one daughter who's 24, who is, uh, her name's Tiana. I think that's, yes, and I'm originally from Nigeria. Hope that helps. Wonderful. That's brilliant. You mentioned that um, we did, you were leading us as a leadership team with, on a cultural intelligence training, and that's what you do. Tell yeah. us a bit briefly, what is uh, cultural intelligence? Yeah, so um, cultural intelligence, and Wayne, do stop me because I can go on about this forever, you know, you know. <laughs> Uh, so it is quite funny when you said to me, you know, let's have this, just so you know, Church, Jennifer was due to preach at CBC today, but obviously because of uh, COVID and restrictions and all that, we decided let's just do it online. And then Jennifer and I said, well, well, let's do the, her sermon via a conversation, but both Jennifer and I can talk, so this could be a, a long conversation, so we'll, we'll do our best, we'll do our best. Sorry, Jennifer, carry on. Okay, so cultural intelligence is all about the capabilities to work effectively across diverse cultural contexts. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's been around for about 30 odd years, but is new to the UK in many ways. And, um, and I work in the diversity and inclusion field. So this is all about equipping people, particularly leaders with the skills to include work effectively with people from different cultures, different environments and work effectively in different cultural contexts. Mm. And so is it, is it more than just uh, BAME issues? Oh, absolutely. It's about culture in its wider sense. It's, and, and that's what I love about it because, you know, I'm, I'm firmly of the opinion that inclusion has to work for everyone or it doesn't work for anyone. And yeah. if anything, I think one of the things we've done for too long is that we've kind of seen inclusion as something we do to that group of people over there. You know, we right. include them. Yeah. Um, and whether that's what we're talking about faith or, or just generally in the workplace, you know, um, that's not been a helpful attitude. There was a great sermon I listened to recently, and I'm sorry I can't remember the guy's name, but he, he compared it to um, being a child in a playground and being a child in a playroom. And he said the playroom um, mentality to faith and Christianity is, it's my playroom, um, mm. I come and play in it and I'm going to sort of decide what you can play with you know mm -hmm. uh, whereas the playground mentality is recognizing that the playground you know belongs to all of us and so actually mm -hmm. you turn and you recognize that the toys in the playground are for everyone mm -hmm. um, I think that's a bit like this you know I think inclusion has to work for everyone in order for it yeah. to work okay but obviously uh, the BAME issues are part of Oh, yes. um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, a big part of that, especially in our in our world at present as well. 
But Jennifer, just to drill down on some of that, while I, I know you fairly well, what I don't know is the forms of racism and struggle that you've had mm. in your life growing up and in your adult professional life as well. Um, are you able to share some of that with us? Yeah, and um, I think, you know, it varies because I, I was born in the UK. So I, I was in the UK probably till I was about seven, eight. Um, mm. And my parents came from Nigeria. So they were, they were um, on scholarships. My dad was studying to be an accountant. My mom um, joined the NHS and, and uh, you know, became a midwife with the NHS. Mm. And I remember even as of then, you know, I was, um, they, because they were both working, they, they sort of farmed me out to foster parents. It was a lovely little, well, not lovely, a strange little system at the time when people would give children to um, other people to look after um, who didn't necessarily have the skills to do that mm. or checked and I remember even then being locked in sheds when visitors came and being sort of mm. hidden because people didn't want you know these people didn't want people to know they had a black child in the house right. that was my first sort of you know I, I wouldn't have I didn't know then it was racism obviously but I knew I was meant yeah. to be hidden away and not and not allowed to be part of you know the family in in, in a certain yeah. Um, and then when I came back to the UK, so I went back to Nigeria when I was about seven, and I came back to the UK, um, probably when I was about, you know, 22, 23, and it's interesting, I was reading, um, you know, the, the profile that, that Sonny wrote, and, and he mm -hmm. said something that really resonated, because I didn't come back to the UK with a concept of what racism was, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't something, having spent most of my young adult life in, surrounded by people who looked like me, I didn't yeah. quite so even when someone said to me when I was looking for a job, you know, um, you know, my, I, when I'd give my name over the phone and I'd say it's Ame Izeko, you know, people would say, yeah, but what's your Christian name, dear? Have you got a Christian name? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, I had Jennifer on my passport, which my father gave me, I think, when I was a baby, but I'd never used it. Wow. And, and so eventually, I, you know, I kept saying to people, every time I'd give my name when I was job hunting and I'd say this and someone would say, yeah, but do you have a Christian name? And, and if I, <laughs> but I think I've got Jennifer on my passport. So I said, Jennifer, you know, and sadly, well, sadly or fortunately, it was a job I got. It was my first job and Jennifer Stark. So, right. Okay. Yeah. And so what? So you hadn't used the name Jennifer till you were in your early 20s? No, never. In fact, my family wow. still call me Jennifer. The only people who call me Jennifer are people I work with. My family yeah. calls me my Nigerian name. Um, so, so again, that would, you know, that, and often that's one of the things that makes people stop feeling like they belong because people mm. either shorten names or they don't take the trouble to try and learn how to say people's names. And, yeah. and that can often be a way of, and it's strange because a name's quite important, isn't it? In the Bible, yeah. God uses names in really powerful ways. And when you when you then have to change your name because it's not accepted, that's a very powerful way of taking yeah. that little view away from you, you know, mm. or people saying, well, I can't pronounce that name. Do you have an English name? Um, yeah. And just things like that. So I think, you know, and then of course there's been, you know, numerous experiences of, at work and I, you know, I don't want to sort of tell a whole tale of woe, but I think it's, it's what's driven me to do the stuff I do today because mm. I, more than anything else, the kind of division and the kind of separation and the, and the breaking down that any sort of discrimination brings is, is completely out of line with who God calls us to be as Christians, yeah. and definitely who Jesus calls us to be. And, you know, what I love about Jesus is the way he included everyone, you know, yeah. Yeah. He, he, you know, from the woman by the well to, to anybody else, you know, he, he, he saw people and he took them for who they were. And I think that's what we've, we've got to be about. Mm. And it's interesting you say that because, Lots of what I've been uh, uh, listening to and reading at the moment, just th th there's often chapters in books where uh, people are, 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 you know, the, the book could be about something completely different, but everybody seems to be coming back to what changed for them is when they realised that, that Jesus accepts them for who they are. Oh, yeah. You know, you know I... and that's so, regardless of whatever culture we're from, that's so important to us, isn't it? It is because, you know, I, I often say that sometimes we need to get out of the way of the cross, you know, because, you know, Jesus died for all of us, you know, and I think to a certain degree, 
we have taken on or some elements of 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 the body have taken on almost the right to say who gets to go to the cross or who gets to be yeah. crucified. and i think that's wrong um and so culture for me is not just about you know the black issues but it's about it's like all the people who feel like they're ma or are made to feel like they're not valued or they don't belong because of something that's different to the majority yeah. that that as christians we we can't afford yeah. to be no not at all why why do you think the killing of George Floyd has had such an impact? It's an interesting one, Wayne. And, and you know how I, I, I sort of try to articulate it? it? It felt like, if you can imagine being force-fed food on a sort of continual basis, and, you know, you've got stuff pushed down you and you just swallow it, and you get stuff mm -hmm. put down and you swallow it, and you push it down and you learn. And, you know, racism the microaggressions that come with it are like that. You, you, you do a lot of swallowing every day. Mm. Actually, you don't want to rock the boat because you don't want to be called the one who's w waving the racist card because you don't mm. want to be the one who's making a fuss, you know? So you learn to sort of just accept it, the comments, the little slides, you just learn to accept it. And, you know, George Floyd wasn't the first thing we'd seen as black people, or, you know, and I'm not on behalf of the whole black race on the internet. But there was something about that. There was something about a man actively kneeling on the neck of another mm. who was handcuffed for eight minutes. That's a long time. Mm. That's a long time to feel that, that you mm. can do. That. And there was something about the fact that people, including his colleagues, could watch this and he could stare at the camera as that was going on. Mm. And I think it was just that final mouthful and suddenly everything just came up. And when yeah. it did, and I think it's that way, you know, when that happens, it's never pretty. And mm. once, I think it felt like once we started throwing up, we couldn't stop because it was, mm. it was the racism of, it was the, it was the stuff in America that was 200 years old. It was mm. the young men who'd been over, the, even before, um, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, there's a list of young men, of yeah. young women who'd been shot in the back, who'd been ill-treated, who'd been, there's our own experiences in this country, thankfully nowhere near as bad. But I think it was just, it just got to a point where you just felt like suddenly you couldn't stop just it all coming up. And, mm. and I think that's what happened. It was just that, it was that thing that broke everything. You mm. know, there was so blatant about it wasn't just, you know, and this is why a lot of people said, oh, you know, it was just man, one man. And, you know, you know, he wasn't, you know, he, maybe he was or wasn't, whatever it was, people decided to yeah. define. But I think what it was, was the, it was the atmosphere that allows a person to think, I have the right to kneel on this person's neck while he cries for his mother, while I know he's dying underneath my knee because he's black. I'm white, I can do that. Yeah. And that, that blatantly sent a message. And I think that's where the Black Lives Matter thing comes from. It's not a set, mm. it's not saying our lives matter than more than anybody else's. It's saying uh, that our lives have to matter as much as anybody. Yes. Yeah. And actually it's at the moment, you know, it's it's black lives that are struggling. Absolutely. You know? Um, and and I don't think anybody that talks to the Black Lives Matter uh, who's experienced some of that racism is saying my life is more important than yours. They're not saying that. They're mm -hmm. saying that this moment in time, we need some help. We need, yeah. you know, we, you know, and and yeah, you, you said an interesting thing uh, about being the force-fed stuff and. Mm -hmm. It's the little, it, it was, you know, the little, the little snipes, the little things that are said that then, you know, cum cumulatively got too much. And we've, you know, as you said, we've known each other for, for quite a long time now. Mm. And just, I, I just want to say something that we've joked in the past about your African timekeeping. <laughs> That's changed now. I'm wonderful at that. I know. You've got your own business now. You have to be good now. 
<laughs> but but you have said, you know, that Ian, your pastor, good friend of both of ours, <laughs> has been working on you with that, you know. And uh, we've joked about you turning up on time and, and you said, oh, Wayne, well, it's an African thing, you know. Yeah. And we know each other well and we can joke about that. And you said, yeah. you know, right at the, when we spoke about doing this, this conversation, to be honest and to just say the things that maybe somebody else wouldn't say to you yeah. because they don't know you as well as I do. Mm -hmm. But do those kind of things offend you? No, and I think when you're joking with friends, no, because that's not, you know, yeah. and we say it's a Welsh thing, you know, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a, yeah. it's a thing, you know? um, and I think that's, and we joke about it. I think what you're talking about are more things that are called microaggressions and the, the little assumptions people make about the fact that, you know, um, you know, because you're black and, and, you know, when people, and, you know, microaggressions work on a whole number of things, people do it about women and, and all sorts mm -hmm. of things, that's when people, you know, almost have these opinions and say, well, you know, um, well, you know, I'm trying to think of the sort of example, you know, the sort of um, where you, where do you come from sometimes can be a microaggression because for instance, mm. my daughter, for instance, is, was born in the UK as far yeah. as she's concerned, she is black British, although she's of Nigerian heritage, you know, but often she- I do remember, so I do, I remember somebody from uh, the church that we knew together in Loughton, Somebody said to him, he, he's back, oh, oh, where are you from? With an assumption that you must be abroad. And he yeah. looked at him and he went, from Romford, mate. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, exactly. But then. Because that's people, where I'm from. Yeah, but then some people will go further and she's had that happen. So I would have said, yeah, but where are you actually from? Yeah. Yeah. You know, which is a very clear, you're not from this country. Yes. Yeah. You know? Or the kind of assumptions that are about, you know, oh, well, you know, you must be a child of a single parent because you're black or, or mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, um, I get asked a lot, which I wouldn't call as a microaggression, but I can't tell you how many times I've been asked if I'm a nurse, right? Now, I, I, I admire, especially at this time, you know, I, yeah. you know, my mom was a nurse. I love the fact that, you know, I think nurses are amazing people, mm -hmm. but it's interesting that there's an assumption often that I am black. I'm a black woman, so I must be a nurse. You know, when I say yeah. to people, or oh, I've been a chief executive or a senior civil servant, or, <laughs> or like, you see people looking at me like, you know, or people say things like, oh God, your English is really good. Right. Yeah, yeah. well, they've said that to my daughter several times. You, you're very well spoken. It's like, oh, oh yeah. okay, that's great. Well, is there a reason why I shouldn't be? You know? Yes. Um, and, yeah. And so, and, and yeah. that can get even more sinister. Um, with the way that people can act and, and they're little put downs that are made to make you feel like, um, you know, you don't belong or people saying, well, mm. these people or those people, you know, when you start referring to people like those people do, yeah. that. well, that's how those people behave. And mm. those are things, little barbs to make you say, well, you know, you're not one of us. We, we can tolerate you mm. and you're okay to be here, but, but know your place. Know mm. your place. And Have you experienced any of this in the church? Um, and I think, I think to not as I wouldn't say a lot, but it's there. There is there sometime. Mm. I think that, and a lot of it sadly came out with the George Floyd stuff. You know, it was mm. that was a really difficult time for a lot of black people in in majority white churches. I think because. Mm. There were, there were some incredibly supportive people, but also there was some really unpleasant stuff that came out as well. Um, and I think even, even in, in churches, you, 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 you get some of that because the church is full of people, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we are all, the, you know, there aren't perfect people in church. That's why we're all seeking mm -hmm. redemption. Yeah. yeah, I think if you speak to a lot of people, especially a lot of, um, you know, black people in majority churches and I think yes they would have experienced some of that along the way mm. along. and that's so what sorry yeah. Jennifer so what so what do you think God wants to say to the church regarding these uh these issues that we're sort of talking about today I think you know we're, we're Christians we're followers of Christ you know mm. and and the one thing is that you know Christ never judged people based on who they were you know mm. He, he, you know, I, I think about the fact, I mean, we don't have pictures of the 12 disciples, but given the people that were around when he grew up, I bet you there were from, there were people from different nations, different places, mm. 
now. Um, when you look at what happened, the first, you know, the, the, you know, the, the reception, the receiving of the Holy Spirit, when that happened, there were 3,000 people from all over the place. Mm. One of the things yeah. is we can all hear our languages being spoken. You know, yes. God is a God of diversity. He is a God of difference. He created us different. He, yes. I think, you know, we haven't ended up with this, you know, strange mistake that all, we're yeah. all different colors all over the world. And mm us to live together and it glorifies his name when we live mm. um so so i i struggle to understand how in one voice we can be followers of christ and in another voice we can discriminate against people i don't get that no. uh, i don't get it i've never had no. i don't think i ever will because i i can't quite imagine i can't quite understand how we we follow someone who in every part of the 33 years he was with us that we know about his message was of love his message was of, of togetherness his message was of compassion so i don't get how we do that mm. are there any particular scriptures that come to your mind when you, you you think of how in the church we can do better and you know what god's saying to us Right, and, and I'm just thinking now, I remember as we started this, I realized that I hadn't um, got my Bible sitting next to me, which is probably for <laughs> I, I, think, I think, you know, I, I think the one that I've been focusing on recently is, is that he is love, God is love. Mm. And I think that's in 1 Peter somewhere where it says you cannot, if, if you say you love God and you do not love, mm. um, then, you know, that's, that's not possible because God is love. And to mm. love means to love our fellow man. You know, Jesus says to us, you know, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. Okay. Now, as far as I understand and the scriptures I've read and the translations I've seen, I don't see any qualification before that neighbor. Mm. You don't say love the neighbor who looks like you. No. Who thinks like you or the one yeah. who's like you. He says, yeah. love thy neighbor as thyself. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And yeah. love your neighbor as yourself. Now, yes. and then he goes on to teach us who our neighbors are. Yeah. And there's that wonderful, <laughs> there is that wonderful of the Good Samaritan. But mm. more than anything else, we talk about the Good Samaritan. I think we could almost call that parable the good neighbor. Because who was yeah. it who saw the neighbor bleeding on the street and, 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 and picked them up, them to the neighboring town? So I think we as a church need to think who is our neighbor and our neighbor are the people who don't look like us our neighbors are the people who don't think like us mm. our neighbors are the people who desperately need god our neighbors and i know that for many churches this is a struggle but you know if i had someone who was gay living next to me and they are my neighbor is god asking me to love my neighbor or is he not yeah he, he is yeah, I, it is. I, I, I don't believe scripture says I can I can distinguish who those neighbors are. There's no um, list in brackets, is there? No, about who we can't, you know. There isn't, a, there isn't an ex, a small print and an exclusion clause, no. you know, in that in the Bible. It says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Um, and love does not judge. Love, love sees all things, it knows all things, it bears all things. And mm. we get to live the Bible or we don't. I don't think we can we can keep picking and choosing which parts mm. of it. Us. Mm. So for us in Cosham, as a as a local Baptist church, would there be because in one sense I don't you know the Baptist Union can can have lots of different things that they say about cultural inclusion. Uh, the, you know, the Church of England can do this and, and, and other denominations can do whatever. But for us as a local church in our community, are there things that we could do that would show that we're loving our neighbour, that we're doing this better? Yeah. If, you know, if this has, you know, if we're being honest and, and actually, you know, we can't move forward if we're not honest, you know, if we're being honest about you know, as the church, you know, we haven't done some of this stuff particularly well. Yes. What could we do? Well, I think, first of all, you know, when we talked about cultural intelligence yesterday, we talked about cultural intelligence drive, which is about, about the persistence and the motivation and going out of your way to engage with different cultures. Mm. But the thing is, you know, when you're Welsh, I'm Nigerian, mm. British okay our cultures and we talked about this just as we were warming up to this yeah. 
from very different places. Okay. Yes. So, so, you know, the first thing that, um, the first thing I think we can always do when we meet people who are different from us is to acknowledge that difference mm. and to say, okay, what, how can I find out more about who you are? You know, I remember when I first joined churches, when I came back to this country and I was a single mom, perhaps the, the most difficult thing was the sense of isolation, the sense that people said hi to me in church, but I'd see the same people during the week and they'd go by and not say hello. You know, mm. that was, it was almost like on the high street, people almost didn't want to admit that they knew me. And then on Sunday, we'd sit next together in church, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think if you're listening to this and you're in church and there's people who've joined the church who are different from you, you know, there may be people from different communities, different cultures, say hello, get to mm. know them, invite them to dinner, get to, mm. you know, I went for years in my, in one of my first churches watching every, every time there was a sort of, you know, invite your friends, you know, get together, celebrate this and that. And I, I, I was never invited anywhere. You know, I, mm. I saw Facebook, but never saw, never got invited, you know, um, but also find out more about, ask questions, because the more we ask about cultures, the more we get to understand them, mm. you know. I think don't judge people by, you know, just what they look like or what they do, you know, but, but get to know the person because Christ died for all of us on the cross. You know, none of us, yeah. none of us get to sort of claim that, that particular gift any more than anyone else, you know, so mm. let's recognize that he died for all of us. Um, and I think recognize that this is a journey, you know, mm. um, and it's a journey on which we'll make mistakes, but your willingness to take the journey to be part of it, to keep walking side by side with an open mind, ready to learn. I think that's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think things are getting better or worse when it comes to all of this? I think that what George Floyd did was it opened up a conversation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at times those conversations have been incredibly painful. Yeah. Okay? I think we still have a long way to go where we can have those conversations in safe spaces. There still is the thing that people are too quick to say, oh gosh, you're calling me a racist. You know, you're, you're accusing me of racism. And sometimes mm. people are just saying, no, my neck hurts. You've got my foot yeah. on my neck right yeah. now. Yeah. Take the foot off and let's talk about why it got there. You know, mm. but when you're sort of like, when people are so touchy about it and it's still bearing in mind that this is a majority culture. And when you start talking about things, people go into this place of real defensiveness. And then you realize that if you continue that conversation, you, you know, people are just going to start, you know, getting really upset. Then actually yeah. you find yourself pulling back. You find yourself not wanting to mm. have a conversation because you don't, you just want people to understand mm. you're hurting. This yeah. isn't. You know, yeah. it's not, racism is an uncomfortable discussion to have, mm. but boy, that's nothing compared to how uncomfortable it feels to be on the end of it. No, I can, I can only imagine. Absolutely. So, so if, if I can bear being on the end of it, then mm. you've got to be able to bear having a discussion with exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah, you definitely. And, and, and I think that's the thing that the, probably what happened with George Floyd is for the first time, we there was a there was an arena in which people were saying i want to listen i want to hear i want to learn and that in many ways was beautiful but it was almost overwhelming as well because mm. you just kind of realized okay okay I, okay this is <laughs> I, need to, I need to understand how i talk safely in this space so mm. at the church where are the safe spaces for you to have those conversations you know mm church if if somebody who's black comes into your church how do they feel and you've got black leaders within the church so that's mm. great but let's push the boundaries what yeah. if somebody who's gay or lesbian walks into your church will they get judged will they get accepted mm. will, will we recognize that actually whatever happens in for all of us whatever is going on in our life the one destination at which everything makes sense is at the foot of the cross mm. Our role as, as, as members of Christ's body is to be a witness to the world for him. And I think if mm. we do that, if we love as he loved us and we love everyone, then I think mm. we, will, we will be his true followers and we'll bring glory to his name. Jennifer, that's, we, could, we could talk for, we could carry on going on all night, but 
uh, that seems like a good place to, I won't say stop, I'll say pause, pause. because it's an ongoing conversation, um, you know, that we all have to be willing to have. Um, but I love what you say, that it, it just comes down to love and mm. just accepting that, you know, our role is not to judge, our role is to love everybody uh, and to let God, you know, if somebody loves me, I, in one sense, I want to let them let God deal with the struggles that I've got in my life, you know, and, 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 and let him work by his spirit, work on me, you know, because uh, we're all a work in progress, aren't we? That's the thing, but it's coming down to love. Is it, is this something uh, that as we close out, particularly I could pray for you in particular? You know, I'm always uh, I'm always open to prayer. Always up for prayer, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think yeah, I think we should just pray. You know, it's it's great that you guys invited me to do this. That is such a huge step, you know, and um and to work with you guys because you've got a passion for this. So I would I'd like us to pray. You know, let's pray for each other. Let's pray for a world that's crying and hurting. Let's yeah. pray that God's love manifests itself across the world we live mm -hmm. in and the people we know and love and. And and um, and let's pray that we can all do more to represent, you know, the greatest love of all. You know, mm. um, let's 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 pray that. Let's do that. Yeah. Father, I want to thank you uh, for being able to have this conversation uh, with Jennifer today. I want to thank you for the insights that she shared. I want to thank you for your word that she has shared, uh, for reminding us that actually it's all about love. And Father, we just want to pray this morning for all those in this world who uh, are being discriminated against, who are not having your love shown to them. And we just pray that you will show us as Christians how we can, uh, how we can be love in this world. Uh, it is a broken world. But Father, we just want to be people that show your love uh, knows no bounds. Uh, it crosses all cultures. Uh, it does not discriminate. It just completely and utterly and unconditionally loves. And Father, we just want to show that to this world because what this world needs is to know the love of Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, and so, Father, help us as your followers uh, to be willing to have these conversations, but be willing to show love, be willing to... Be that person that crosses the road because that person may not look like us, but you have, you've implanted, imprinted on our hearts that they are our neighbour. So help us to do that, we pray. Yeah. And through your son, and thank you that we don't do it on our own, that you go with us as well. And through your son, Jesus, we pray. Bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.